Brother Mike, could I get you to lead prayer for us tonight? We started out with 40 books. We handed them all out eventually. I've got some more ordered, but it may be next week before we get them. So I'm sorry. If you, if you have your Bible, though, you can turn to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 11, and can kind of follow along. 1 Kings, chapter 11. We were talking about Solomon's apostasy. We've been through Saul and David and now Solomon. We're going to pass him tonight and get on to Rehoboam and Jeroboam next. But uh, Solomon apparently did what a lot of people do. He thought he was going to be the exception. He knew what God had said about multiplying horses and multiplying wives and how that those wives could lead you astray. And apparently he thought he was the exception. So much so that uh, he intermarried with the heathens, which the Lord had told them not to do. He ended up having 700 wives, 300 concubines. One little boy said 300 porcupines, but it was concubines. And... Uh, so he wasn't the exception, and he did not escape the consequences of all of those marriages that were forbidden by God. And he should have learned that he wasn't the exception. And Solomon wanted romance and sensual pleasure, all that. There is no record that Solomon was emotionally close with any of his wives. We just don't see that, do we? How could he be? <laughs> You got that many. And how would a wife feel in that kind of a situation where she's one of a thousand? Uh, well, it's just not a good situation at all. But it says Solomon clung to these in love. And apparently the idea of love there more is, is more lust than anything else. But uh, he wanted all of that more than he wanted the Lord. And the ironic thing is that the Lord spoke to Solomon twice. I, I think we would all think that if God actually actually spoke to us, boy, that would register on our minds, and we wouldn't ever forget that, and it would have an impact on us. But that happened to a lot of people in the Bible, and it didn't seem to last. <laughs> and certainly Solomon is one of those cases where God spoke to him twice and he didn't remain faithful. So he had to know the Lord is real. He had to know the Lord ha had a will on this subject. And yet with all of these different wives and princesses, almost an unbelievable believable number, uh, did he pledge to all of them till death do us part? <laughs> You have to wonder that. Uh, doubtful that he did. But uh, they were, these wives and these concubines were legal partners without the same standing as wives would have. I'm not sure what all the differences were, but Solomon had far more marriage partners than any man could possibly give attention to. And uh, he couldn't even spend one day a year with each of his wives. It'd take three years to spend one day with each of his wife, each of these women, wives and concubines. A concubine was kind of a legal mistress, and there were many prominent men in the Old Testament who had concubines. Uh, uh, Abraham had Hagar. He wasn't married to Hagar, but he had a 
child by her, that Sarah's idea, uh, since they were she couldn't have children and they were getting old. And of course, God did allow them to have a child, and and Ishmael was not the child of promise. Isaac was, and when Sarah was ninety and Abraham was a hundred, they had Isaac. Jacob had some. Well, he had uh, Jake, uh, Leah and Rachel's handmaids as well. He had children by them. Caleb had uh, concubines. Saul, of course, had them, King Saul. David had them. Rehoboam had them. And the Bible never shows that kind of family life to be blessed. It just doesn't happen. What we know about those situations... Uh, is not good. Polygamy doesn't have a good history. It didn't have a good history in the Bible. It didn't have a good history among the Mormons. And I've mentioned several times that I have a book written by one of Brigham Young's wives, and the name of her book is Wife Number 19. I've got that book. It's a pretty thick book. <laughs> she had a lot to say. And polygamy just wasn't a good thing, especially if you were a wife. And so... I don't know if we could blame Solomon following his father's example. Uh, that's certainly a, a real possibility by having multiple marriage partners. David had multiple, not nearly as many as Solomon, but he had uh, a number, quite a number, 20 women, I believe he did, and uh, many wives and concubines. And so we can sol say that Solomon had so many marriage partners because of his lust had to be a big part of it, and that's a profound and sobering example, I think we could say, of the principle that if one wife is not enough to satisfy a man, then a thousand can't either, and apparently those thousand didn't either. Either, So, you what? He had abundance of everything, didn't he? No, it sure didn't. You can have too much of a good thing. And uh, Solomon should have listened to something he wrote in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20. Held and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. And he was never satisfied. I remember, I think I mentioned this before, Brother Yader Tant years ago with the Florida lectures made a statement. He said, I'd like to think that it was on Solomon's first marriage that he said, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And I'd like to think that it was after several hundred marriages that he said it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a wide room with a brawling woman. <laughs> Don't know that that's the way it was, but it uh, certainly would have been appropriate for him to come to that conclusion. Um, you have to wonder when he made statements like there were a couple of statements like that about uh, dwelling in the, uh, with a brawling woman couple of statements, and you have to wonder if he's speaking from experience there, inspired to speak from experience. And uh, I don't know. He could have said, look how many wives I can support. Look how many women I have authority over. Uh, there are a lot of things that could have caused his head to swell, but uh, all of it was a disaster, mostly. And so uh, he... He, his lust apparently was not satisfied. But uh, the Bible says his wife, uh, yes, uh, Palmer? Couldn't the daughter of his father and father of his mother be the same as his wife and his mother be his wife? Because we are very good people to talk about the fact that they couldn't be the same sex. Well, that's a good good point. It's It's easy to see the problems of others, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a point at which his wisdom turned into folly. Uh, wisdom of this world, a lot of it was. And uh, um, based on the Song of Solomon, if you read the Song of Solomon, we can say that 
At the first, Solomon seemed to know what true love was with one woman. And that's expressed in the Song of Solomon, and yet his subsequent history shows that it's possible to be in that place and then depart from it. And I think that's what happened to him. And it's uh, not true. Uh, there was a song a few years ago, Love Will Keep Us Together. <laughs> that's not necessarily so. Solomon knows that we can know true love and then depart from it. And so it's better said that the blessings and power of God upon our obedience will keep us together. So we've got to keep trusting in God. We need Every marriage needs God in it. I often tell couples, if I've been asked to perform a wedding, that it takes three beings to make a marriage, and every marriage will be made up of three. It's either a man and a woman and God, or a man and a woman and the devil. God only comes into your marriage by invitation. And if God is not invited into your marriage, the devil will come without an invitation as an intruder. He doesn't feel like he needs an invitation. And, and I believe that that's true, and, and that's why I always tell couples that when they uh, want to get married. We don't know when Solomon added his second wife. Uh, but when he did, it was easy for him to rationalize. After all, he's the greatest king of Israel, after David, and uh, and greatest in as far as riches and all of that. He's remembered for that. And his father David had several wives and concubines. So uh, once he followed his father into that departure from God's plan, from God's plan was the same from the beginning. And when Jesus gave the marriage law in Matthew chapter 19, he went back to the beginning, showing that this has always been God's marriage law, and that is that a man has to leave his wife, or leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And uh, Jesus restated that. So it still applied. And God, for the hardness of their hearts, suffered them to put away their wives, even allowing them polygamy at times and that was I think during the period when God winked at ignorance and since a lot of that time uh, there wasn't any written law God was more tolerant of people at that time but it tells us in Acts 17 that at one time God winked at ignorance but now he commands all men everywhere to repent and because the gospel apparently was in its fullness. Now that's in Acts 17. It's in chapter 20 of Acts that Paul said that he had declared the whole counsel of God and he kept back nothing that was profitable. So apparently all the truth had been revealed at that time. It hadn't been written down at that point, but it had been revealed. Kind of like Peter's statement, we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Doesn't mean that was the last thing written in the Bible, but by the time he wrote that, all the truth had been revealed at least in its oral form, hadn't been all written down yet. So God commands all men everywhere to repent. And it was easy to keep adding wives, especially when you had as much money as Solomon did. What's ironic and interesting, how many children did Solomon have? We're not told unless it's just one. We're only told the name of one. Uh, you have to wonder, a, a thousand women, how many children that could multiply into and how much money that would take. <laughs> but we're not told about the other children. We're only told one of them, Rehoboam, and what happened there. So when you think about that, uh, Solomon had to put brakes on, and yet he had plenty of money. And you have to wonder how old he was by the time he married the thousand, thousandth, or took on the thousandth woman. But as he took on wives, he broke a commandment of God that God gave to the future kings of Israel back in Deuteronomy 17:17. 17, 17, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. And Solomon did multiply wives to himself, and it did turn away his heart. He was not immune. He was not the exception, was he? Okay. 
Yeah, some of it apparently would have happened when he's old. We don't know, but uh, it's interesting. You know, many commentators believe that Solomon was about twenty when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years, and and then he died after that. So he apparently was in his sixties when he died. If that's the case, so that may have shortened his life. All all those marriages, uh, I can imagine problems that would have caused could have shortened his life but uh, it would be useless I guess to would have been useless to argue with Solomon for the claims of idols uh, he could have at once by uh, just just by his wisdom have annihilated all the infidel arguments if he had wanted to I mean he had to be a believer in the one God who spoke to him twice and who gave him wisdom, and Solomon acknowledged that. He knew that. So how could he do what he did? It's hard to question the answer. But the whole story of King Solomon is full of, of a lot of value, solemn value, we could say. Uh, he, his was a life full of promise, but it ended in failure and gloom. It wasn't a happy life you would think it would be. Because his heart turned from loyalty to God to loyalty in response to the seductions of earthly pleasures, the money, all the things Solomon had. Uh, there was not anything that he didn't want that, that he didn't get. He had living entertainment. He had living living stereo before it came into vogue. Well, he had living performances. Uh, yes, go ahead. a temptation twist the scriptures it's all been a <laughs> I suppose it would <laughs> He may have, and he may have rationalized, well, they need me. <laughs> they need me. And maybe painted a picture like, well, Ruth, of course. Ruth's a good example. She, she uh, was in poverty. Her husband died. She could have turned to immorality because there weren't any, wasn't any Social Security or anything, programs like that for people who were widows in her situation. But she didn't turn to immorality, and she didn't uh, turn to thievery or anything like that. She was patient, and God blessed her with Boaz. Uh, yes, Rick? With, with other kings, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he was a collector uh, of wives. Uh, it kind of looks like they were treated as possessions, not as people. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And they they influenced him, no question about it. They had an influence on him. When you're one person and you've got a thousand people who have a different position than you do, it's easy to be influenced by that. And he could have thought, well, I can do this now and I'll repent later. <laughs> yeah. Well, if he did that for them, then they had to be singing his praises. <laughs> he was getting something out of it, I think. Yeah, you can see how he could have rationalized all that. Of course, it didn't justify it. And uh, uh, the First Timothy chapter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, apparently he wanted to please them, and and uh, they they apparently sang his praises for doing that. Yeah, he did. He wanted to please them more. Well, it says in verse six of chapter eleven, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Well, we know that David had a period of time in his life when he didn't follow the Lord. But David's sin didn't turn his heart away from the Lord like it did Solomon. And so it's possible for particular sin in one person's life to be a hindrance uh, more so than in others. That's all we can say about that. But uh, all of this, David's lack of it, if, it, if Solomon was following his example, um, it certainly was another consequence of all the problems that would have come to David's household like that and and of course Solomon didn't hinder his restraint we don't know of Solomon ever hindering his restraint of anything until right at the last of Ecclesiastes and there's a debate whether Solomon repented at the end or whether he died out of fellowship with the Lord oh. Okay, well, look at the different gods that are mentioned there that Solomon went after. Verse 5, chapter 11. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and so forth. So we've got some different ones named that he went after, and I think there's another uh, list of them named after uh, uh, first idols, too. Pardon? Verse 7. Uh, yeah, okay. Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. Remember, Molech, they offered children to him. Child sacrifice. Uh, and uh, 
some of the commentators that write about that, how that they would heat that statue within with a, uh, with a fire, and when the fire got as hot as it could be, they would lay that child on that statue, and to keep from hearing the squalls of the child, they would make a lot of noise on drums and all kinds of instruments so they couldn't hear the child screaming. That had to be, well, you have to wonder what kind of, how a person's mind can get to that point. Uh, That's a good question. Uh, of course, Solomon always had it. He had a lot of choices to make, and uh, the more choices, I guess, and the more bad ones he made, he just kept on going. But uh, no, I know it. <laughs> but all these different gods that he went after, and probably Solomon didn't see this as a denial of the Lord God of Israel in his mind. He probably thought he was honoring the Lord and. And he simply added the honor of these other gods to his honor of the Lord. You know, a lot of times the idolaters didn't necessarily fail to acknowledge Jehovah. They just added more gods. He was just one of the other gods. And so they didn't feel they were wrong as long as they still honored him too. He, he sure did, yeah. Uh, but... We've mentioned before, and I had a lesson not long ago, our God is a jealous God. He demands to be the only God in our life, and that is for our good because he is the only one that can save us. And if we go after other gods, there's a chance we won't be saved, a really good chance we won't be saved. That's why we need him, and that's why he's jealous for us. And so Solomon found himself in a place where he probably never thought he would find himself. Uh, early on, found himself burning the incense at the altars of these pagan gods and even gods that uh, they offered child sacrifices to. And there's that power of lust of things and people. And it can capture a person in a spell, in a fog, can cause all kinds of spiritual confusion. And I think Solomon reached that point of spiritual confusion. It wasn't justified. But if this was the case with the wisest man who ever lived, then what hope do we have apart from the dependence on Jesus Christ that something like that wouldn't happen to us? Um, that's why I say probably the greatest blessing that's happened to many of us is the fact that we didn't win the sweepstakes because <laughs> you never know what those kind of things can turn your heart. And so the Bible says the Lord became angry with Solomon. He had a special reason to be angry with Solomon and displeased with Solomon because God had appeared to him twice and Solomon still went after other gods after the God of heaven appeared to him twice. How many times do you think those other gods appeared to him? <laughs> Not once. <laughs> Not once did those other gods appear to him, but the God of heaven appeared to him twice, and he still left him for the other gods. So there was just a really base ingratitude on Solomon's part and a great waste of a, of a great spiritual privilege that he had to do a lot of good but didn't do it. Um, and sometimes we think that some kind of a great spiritual experience Solomon had a great spiritual experience, but sometimes we tend to think that if we could have a great spiritual experience, that that would keep us from sin and keep us faithful to God, but there is no guarantee of that. And we see examples of people that fell away from God, even though they had had great spiritual experiences. And so 
Uh, it reminds us of the statement of Paul. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So there is a danger of falling and the time when we're ripe for that is when we think we're so strong we can't fall. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed. He's the guy that's in danger. Take heed lest he fall. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that may have been part of Solomon's problem. He thought he was so strong and he'd had this great spiritual experience and had all of this stuff, had so much stuff that uh, probably couldn't keep track of it all. Yeah. Yeah, Peter saw all the miracles. Um, I don't know if Peter was present when any of the people that Jesus raised from the dead, if he was there, but he had to know about it and he had to believe it because he saw other miracles that Jesus did that couldn't be explained uh, without him being from God. So, Yeah, and Peter was the first one to confess that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter knew who Jesus was. But I believe Peter fell away when he realized he couldn't fight a carnal battle. As long as he could use a sword and whack people up like he cut off the ear of Malchus, he wasn't afraid at that point, and he was ready to defend Jesus with a sword. But when Jesus rebuked him, told him to put his sword away, I think that was the only way Peter knew how to fight. And when he had to put his sword away, he became a coward. He couldn't defend himself or propagate the message of Christ with a sword. Well, anyway, uh, uh, we think about this. God promised the entire kingdom of Israel to the descendant of David forever. And if they only remained obedient. And David reminds Solomon of this promise shortly before his death there in 1 Kings chapter 2. So let's notice that. 1 Kings 2 and verse 4. Yeah, uh, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So he was told that if they walk in his ways, there will always be a descendant of David on the throne. And... Uh, Solomon, uh, David repeats that to Solomon. So Solomon had a lot of th reasons why he should have remained faithful, but they didn't remain faithful even in one generation. Solomon's kingdom, I, I guess, is probably the most outstanding example of wealth, of military power, of prestige, all of that, all the chariots and horses he had. And yet the security of Israel didn't rest in any of those things. And neither does the security of the United States rest in those things. Uh, like we sometimes sing, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. When we're trusting in the arm of flesh and not in the Lord, then that's a dangerous place to be. And so he did say to David, I will not do it in your day or to Solomon, I will not do it in your day for the sake of your father David. I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. And that's what happened. We see that. So for the sake of David, because David, although he went astray for a period of time, he came back to the Lord and is still described as a man after God's own heart. And so we see here a measure of I hate to use the phrase undeserved mercy because all mercy is undeserved. But in this case, uh, God goes overboard with his mercy, it seems, in that he doesn't do it in the days of Solomon, that he spares Solomon for that because of God's relationship with David. He does this for Solomon. 
And that's, that's remarkable. So God kind of put some undeserved mercy in this. Uh, when judgment was what, what was needed or what deserved there. But God announced that the kingdom would be divided. And part of it's going to be loyal to the descendants of David. And part of it's going to be under a different dynasty. God could have just given the whole thing away. But he didn't give the whole thing away. He spared a remnant. And there are a lot of other passages in the Old Testament that tell us about the southern kingdom being made of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. But uh, several times in this chapter, the southern kingdom is referred to as one tribe. And I don't know if that means that the tribe of Judah had kind of swallowed up the tribe of Benjamin or, or what. But, but anyway, Benjamin is, is kind of uh, the lesser of the two. Well, God raises up some adversaries for Solomon. Solomon has had it good for a long time. But God raises up some adversaries. First one is Hadad the Edomite. Look at verse 14, chapter 11. Now the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was a descendant of the king of Edom. For it happened when David was in Edom and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain after he had killed every male in Edom because for six months Joab remained there with all Israel until he had cut down every male in Edom. That Hadad fled to go to Egypt, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him. Hadad was still a little child. Then they arose from Midian and came to Paran and they took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt to Pharaoh king of Egypt who gave him a house apportioned food for him and gave him land and Hadad found great favor and of course he grows uh, to power and he becomes thorn in the side of Solomon so Solomon's reign was glorious but God didn't allow it to be completely without problems did he and uh, a lot of the problems were of Solomon's own making. But the Bible does tell us God raised up adversaries like Hadad. And when he went to Hiram to assist him in building of the temple of, of the Lord, he said there was no, uh, first, well, First Kings chapter 5, verse, there was no adversary. Uh, so at one point he didn't have any adversaries. But now he does. And we're going to see two or three others after this that God raises up three of them, Hadad and Rezon and Jeroboam, all become adversaries to him. So Hadad's a king, a descendant of the king of Edom, and he sought to avenge, avenge what uh, had happened under uh, Joab, killing all the males. But then next we read about Rezon from the north country, another adversary, and Solomon was remarkably successful, but he wasn't Superman. He may have thought he was, but he wasn't. We kind of get the idea Solomon thought too highly of himself, and maybe he thought he was Superman, but God allowed adversaries from the south, who was Hadad, and now from the north, Rezon from the north, and God knew that Solomon need, needed some kind of an adversary. And he knew how many adversaries Solomon needed. And then Rezon is the son of e Eliadad, it says, Eliada. He came from the north, so the north and the south. And a lot of times people are shaped by their adversaries. And uh, we may see some of that here. But then Jeroboam becomes kind of a special adversary, doesn't he? Jeroboam, the servant of Solomon. Uh, let's look at it in verse 26. Then Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zerida, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what, so what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the millow and repaired the damages to, uh, to the city of David, his father, the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. 
Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite met him in the way and he had clothed himself with a new garment and the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces and he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. Well, Solomon never dreamed that was going to happen to his servant. <laughs> and this is going to kind of stick in his craw that a servant's going to become his rival and going to take away ten of the tribes um, away from him. So that's kind of ironic that it's the servant. And uh, we see what happened here. He talked about him being the... So, and also... Uh, uh, he's described as a man of valor. I don't know that Solomon was ever a fighting man. He didn't ever have to. Uh, so that kind of makes it more of a threat. And he had been appointed over the labor force of Solomon. And Jeroboam, his name means may the people be great. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the fact that he was kind of a populist but he gained a following he gained a following and uh, um, it's probable that Jeroboam was never idle but like a politician he's busy and he's building him a following and so now he's declared a mighty man of valor and Ahijah apparently was raised up by God to give this message to Jeroboam that um, He's going to be over 10 of the tribes. Now, I've, I got Jeroboam and Rehoboam confused uh, recently. I've got to remember when we were studying, teaching the, our spiritual heritage, a good way to remember and keep Jeroboam and Rehoboam straight, Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Don't let the J's get together. Jehosh uh, Jeroboam did not reign in Jerusalem. He reigned in greater Israel. So don't let the J's get together. Jeroboam and Jerusalem don't go together. Uh, Rehoboam was reigning there. And so God promised to divide them, and he'd keep one tribe under the house of David in his faithfulness to his promise. God is always keeping his promises, and we see tidbits like this throughout. God's keeping a promise, and because of David, he kept that promise. And this is the first time we read about a divided kingdom. And it became part of Israel's history uh, for hundreds of years till the death of Solomon. I say hundreds of years, not, not hundreds of years in uh, Solomon's lifetime, but because uh, he didn't live that long. But the ten tribes under Jeroboam would be larger and greater and more enduring than the one tribe left to the house of David, we would think. But as it worked out, kind of the opposite happened. And the tribe of Judah became more numerous. Um, but anyway, Jeroboam had a great... What, what, what opportunity did God give Jeroboam? God gave Jeroboam a, a really great opportunity. He said, I'll take you, I'll give, I'll give you reign over all your heart desires, and you'll be king over Israel. And... He said, if you'll follow me, God told him he would make him great. But Jeroboam didn't do it. He didn't do it. He used his own ingenuity, and that, of course that didn't work. And I think that's the second bell, isn't it? So we'll mark our places there. We're almost to the end of chapter 11.
blessing tonight will be uh, number 950, 950, Lamb of God. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sinned, and from your side, to walk upon this guilty son, and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, see Lamb of God, I love the
things we'll talk about pray about prayer. Uh, prayer is a big, a big help in my life, and I bet prayer is a big help in your life as well. Talk about prayer tonight, and praying for one another, and, and everything. Because next week, uh, a lot of our young people are starting, back school, uh, and also a lot of young people start back college. They're going to need our prayers. As times have changed, struggles are always. The
843. As the deer panteth for the water. As the deer panteth for the water. Thank you for another wonderful day. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for this church and this congregation to come here, worship your word, and sing songs, praise your name. Thank you for Brother Jeff who put his time and efforts into bringing this lesson that we may take it in, use it in our lives, Lord. We thank you for the preachers of this congregation like Brother Dick and Brother John who are up here putting in time, preaching lessons that we can take and put in our lives, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Please forgive us our sins. Stay with us through this week until the next time we meet again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.